Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to look at how we can extend types in a hot chocolate GraphQL API. Now, extending types gives us the ability to customize classes that might be outside of our control. For example, classes that might be coming from a third party NuGet package. So over here on the left hand side, you'll notice that I have gone on ahead and created a basic GraphQL API. You'll see that we have an application DB context with a DB set for authors and books. We also have an author class which contains an ID and name. And we also have a book class which contains an ID, title and author ID. There existing a one to many relationship between an author and books used in the author ID navigation property. You'll notice that we also then have a query class and that query contains an author's query and a book's query to return authors and books respectively. And last but not least, in our startup logic, you can see that we are adding a DB context and then we're also adding our GraphQL server, adding in the query type and registering the DB context. Towards the bottom of the file, if the application is running in the development environment, we migrate the database and we also add some seed data so that we have a number of authors and books to use in this sample. So what you could imagine is that the author class and book class in our DB context might be coming from a third party NuGet package that's outside of this GraphQL API. And you may wish to annotate these classes with GraphQL related attributes. Now, of course, that is possible if you have control over these classes, if they're in the same project or solution. However, that's not possible if these classes come from, for example, a third party NuGet package that's outside of your control. Equally, you may not wish to pollute your DB context entity classes with GraphQL attributes if you don't want to. And that's where you can use the type extension functionality in hot chocolate to get around this problem. So what we're going to do is create two uh, custom object types for author and for book. So what we do is we will right click API. We're going to add a new class and we're going to call the class author type. We're going to specify that author type extends object type and it's going to be of type author. Next up, we're going to do the exact same thing for book type. And then we're going to say book type extends object type, and that's going to be of type book. So there we have our two uh, custom object types, author type and book type. And what we're going to do now is add those into the startup. So where we've got our call to add GraphQL server, we're going to specify add type, author type, like so. And we'll also specify add type, book type, in order to add in both the author type and the book types to the GraphQL server. So that's the types added into GraphQL. And what we're going to do now is we're going to build and run the API project. Open up the browser. And if you go to localhost forward slash GraphQL, we create a document, applying the defaults, make sure the schema is up to date. And if we now create a query, we're going to query for books. And you can see here we have ID, title and author ID. So what I'm going to do is query for title and author ID. And if we now run that, you can see that we get the title of the book and also the ID of the author who authored the book. Now, what you might want to do, for example, is ignore one of those fields. In other words, hide a particular field from appearing in the GraphQL schema. So what we can do in our book type class, we're going to want to override the configure method like so. And then what we can do is we can say descriptor dot field. And then using a Lambda, we can select the book dot author ID field. And we can then say that we want to ignore that field. So if we now stop and rerun the API in order for those changes to take effect, if we then reopen the browser, 
And if we reload the schema, notice that we now have red squiggles under the author ID because the author ID field is not found on the type book. And we can confirm this by opening up the schema reference, looking at the book type, and seeing how we now just have an ID field and a title field. And that's because in the uh, book type, object type, we have specified that we want to ignore the author ID field. So therefore, even though it exists on the underlying book entity class, it's not going to show up in the schema and therefore will not be queryable by consumers of the GraphQL API. So that's showing you how you can essentially remove a field from the GraphQL schema. Now what we're going to do is look at how we can add a field to the schema. So what we're going to do is add an author field to our book type so that as well as the author ID, we also have the author object. So what we're going to want to do is create a new field and we're going to name it author. And then we can get rid of the ignore like so. And what we're going to do is say resolve. And this is going to be an asynchronous uh, function. And this is going to have the resolver context provided into it. And this is then going to return the author. So what we are going to do is we're going to say var key values. And this is going to be a list of the primary keys. So what we're going to do is say new object array like so. And then we're going to say context dot parent of type book dot author ID like so. And essentially what that is doing is it's telling this resolver to look at the parent of the resolver context. And the parent in this case is the type book because this is uh, configuring the book type Inside this resolver, we have access to the parent book that this resolver is running for. And then we specify the author ID. So essentially what that is saying is get me the author ID of the book that is currently being uh, resolved. So this will essentially run once for each of the books in the database. And then each time it's going to get the author ID of that book and add the author ID into this array of key values. Next up, we're going to get the cancellation token, and this can be found in context.request aborted. And that will be passed down from GraphQL to notify us if the request has been canceled, so that we can then forward that on down to Entity Framework to cancel the query in the database should the underlying request in GraphQL be cancelled by the consumer. So now that we have our key values and our cancellation token, we can put those together into our entity framework query. So what we're going to do is say return await context.service, and this is going to be of type application DB context. And that's basically going to resolve the application DB context from our service provider in ASP.NET Core. And then we're going to say dot authors dot find async. And then we're going to provide our key values and also our cancellation token. And essentially that is therefore going to find us the author in the authors table that matches the author ID of the current book. Now, last but not least, there's a couple of extra bits that we're going to want to add just beneath our resolve. And the first of those is to specify that this field should be resolved serially. Now, by default, at the time of writing, GraphQL will attempt to resolve fields in parallel. And that means that resolvers will run at the same time in parallel, as the name suggests. Now, that can be okay. However, in our case, because we are using the application DB context and we only have a single scoped application DB context, we need these resolvers to run serially because application DB context in Entity Framework Core don't support multiple queries being executed at the same time using the same DB context. So by running these resolvers serially, it means that even though we're using the same scoped application DB context, we're only ever going to be performing one query at a time 
because, as I say, these resolvers are running serially one after the other instead of running by parallel, uh, which they will by default uh, without specifying any attributes. So now that we've set up our resolver to run serially because of our application DB context, we can last but not least specify the return type of this field. And this is going to be a non null type of type author type. So that basically tells GraphQL that this field is going to be of type author and that the author cannot be null. In other words, there should always be an author that corresponds to this book. And that makes sense because we've configured the relationship in the database to be a required relationship. In other words, a book must have an author. It can't exist in the database without an author. Hence why we can specify the GraphQL type as a non-null author type, because each book will always have an author. So what we can do now is we can stop and rerun our GraphQL API, give it a few seconds, for it to rebuild and spin up. If we then come back into the browser, and if we now reload the schema, if we look at our book type, you'll notice that we now have an author field as well as the author ID, ID and title. So if we flick back to our operation, we have our title and author ID. What we can do though, is instead of saying author ID, we can specify author. And then we can specify that we want to return the name of the author. So if we now run that query, you'll notice that we get our data containing the list of books and each book has a title and also the name of the author. If we then take a look at the queries run in the database, you can see that we had a number of serially executed queries to select ID and name from authors where the author ID equals the parameterized author ID that comes from the context.parent of type book. So essentially what this is doing is it's saying for each uh, book, run this resolver function, and this resolver function is going to get the author ID of said book, and it's then going to query the database to find the author that corresponds with the author ID of said book. And then we specify to run that resolver serially such that each query is executed one after the other using the DB context. Now, of course, you could optimize this and specify the resolvers to run in parallel using, for example, a DB context pool. However, for the purposes of this sample, we're going to keep it straightforward and use our single scoped DB context and run the resolvers in uh, serial fashion running each query one after the other. So that's shown you how you can add a field onto a type where the field doesn't already exist. And last but not least, we're going to take a look at how we can replace a field. So you'll notice that our book type contains, uh, the our book entity, sorry, contains the author ID. Now, at the moment, with the added author field, we expose both author ID and author in the GraphQL schema. But something that you might want to do is replace author ID with the author. And so that's what we're going to do now. Where we have our field with the name author, we're going to remove the string name and we're going to replace that with our book lambda. And we're going to say book.author ID. And then what we're going to do beneath that, we're going to specify name author. And essentially what that's telling GraphQL do, to do is it's saying the author ID field, rename that field to author and run this resolver function to get the value for that particular field. So what we've got is our field author ID being overridden to be named author and then to use the value that's re returned from the resolver instead of any other value, for example, the author ID from the database. We're going to keep the uh, call to serial because again, we want these resolvers to be run serially because they use the DB context. And we can keep the type to be non-null type of author type because again, much like before, each book has a required author.
So if we now stop and rerun the API, give it a few seconds to uh, shut down and then restart. And if we now pop into Banana Cake Pop, and if we once again reload the schema, if we now take a look at the schema reference and our book type, you'll notice that the author ID field has now been replaced by the author field. So instead of having both author and author ID, we now just have a single field for author alongside the ID and the title fields. So back in the operations, no change here to the query that we're running. And if we run that again, we don't get a change to the results. Once again, returning a list of books with the title of the book and the name of the author who authored the book. So that's the three, if you like, most common scenarios when you're extending a type. You either want to hide a field using ignore or add a field using a custom name inside the call to descriptor.field or you might want to replace an existing field by specifying the field using the lambda, in our case book.authorid, potentially renaming that field to something more appropriate, in our case author, and then defining a custom resolver function that will run to get the value for that particular field, ignoring, in our case, the author ID that's come from the database, and instead using the value that's returned from the resolver function. Now, last but not least, we're going to do something similar with the author type. So what we do inside our author type is we will override the configure method and we're going to say descriptor.field and we're going to add a field called books. And as the name suggests, this is going to return the list of books that the author has authored. So after our call there to descriptor.field, we can say resolve and this is going to specify a context with the lambda. And then we're going to say var id equals context.parent of type author dot id. That's essentially going to get the current author and give us the id of that author. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say return context.service of type application db context dot books dot where and then we're going to say book dot author id equals id and essentially what that is saying is go into the database and get me all of the books where the author id of the book equals the id of the current author in this particular resolver much the same as the resolver in our book type the resolver is going to run once for each author that's returned from the database and so essentially context.parent of type author.id is going to get us each of the author IDs for each of the authors from the database. And then it's going to use that author ID in the where query in the application DB context to query for the books where the book author ID equals the ID. Much like what we did with our uh, author resolver in the book type, we're going to specify that this resolver should run serially because we're using our application DB context and we haven't set up DB context pooling in this sample. And then last but not least, we will specify the type that is returned from the resolver, the type of this field. And that's going to be a non-null type of type list type of type book type. Bit of a mouthful there, but essentially what that is saying is this field is going to be a non-null list of books. So what we can do in order to see those changes take effect is stop and rerun our API. Give it a few seconds to build the API and to spin it up. And if we then come back into the browser and then if we reload the schema, we can replace our books query and we can instead say authors and then we're going to return uh, the name of the author. And we're also going to return the title of the books that this author has authored. If we now hit run, you'll notice in our data response from the API, we have each of our authors. And then each author has a nested list of books with each book returning the title and each of those books that the author has authored.
we then take a look at the uh, output from the logs, we can see that much like the uh, book type resolver that we defined earlier, we can see that each of those queries has run serially to select the ID, author ID and title from books where the author ID matches the currently being resolved author. Once again, just to highlight that the resolver will run once for each author that is retrieved from the database, much the same way that each of the um, author fields in the book type, that resolver function running once for each book in the database. So in this sample, we've defined a custom GraphQL object type for author and book. And then we've essentially extended the author entity and the book entity from our application DB context. And I've shown you how you can ignore a field that you don't want to be exposed in the GraphQL schema. I've shown you how you can add a field that's not in the underlying entity type, but that you do want to be available in the schema. And then I've also shown you how you can replace a field that you might want to map to a different value. For example, in our instance, we've replaced the author ID property on the book entity with an author type in the GraphQL schema so that it returns something a little bit more useful to consumers of the GraphQL API instead of just the GUID author ID. It gives the consumer the ability to specify properties on the author type, such as the author's name instead of just their ID. So I hope you found this video useful. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.